I've got a question for you, and I just, uh, do you think when it comes to belief, belief in God, that faith is blind? We believe just because, I don't know, just kind of like the lottery tickets. I know I'm going to win. I know God exists. Is that how faith is built? A lot of people think it is. One of the greatest phrases used of faith, it's a, a blind leap into the dark. But is it? Or is faith reasonable? Hebrews 11.1 1 says that belief in God, faith in God, has a certainty, an assurance of things not seen. In other words, faith is actually standing on solid ground, but how can it be if I can't see God? We're going to talk about that today. There's also another problem when it comes to faith. People say, if, if, you, if you think what your belief is true... Well, so is mine. Truth, everybody's got their own truth. So really, faith isn't necessarily reasonable. It's just what you want to believe. I want you to take your Bibles to set a framework of faith. And I want to begin by saying that we have been made to be reasonable people. There's a false teaching that there's a different mindset from the Eastern mind and the Western mind. Eastern mind, it's both hands. You can believe whatever you want. The Western mind, we put things in categories. I'm just going to tell you, God, as a human being, made you to be reasonable. Go to Matthew chapter 16, and I want to show you, based on something you and I are both familiar with, the sky. Jesus uses that as a metaphor. In Matthew chapter 16, he's in an argument with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Go ahead, you can. And this is going to be called Red Sky in Reason. And this is going to format our teaching in John today. The Pharisees and Sadducees didn't believe Jesus was God. So they tested him. And he says in verse 2, When evening comes, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. There's three things I want to point out with this. Number one, Jesus says, you know how to read the signs in the sky. I used to live across from Lake Erie, and there's this big cliff. And my dad and I, a lot of times, would lean over the fence and just look out on the lake, and you could see the whole horizon. And one night it was red. And he said, Chris, you see when the sun sets, and if it's red, that means a front is leaving. And so the cirrus clouds that are at the end of the front light up red. So you know tomorrow will be nice. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. But if it's in the morning and it's a red sky, that means the cirrus clouds are precluding a front coming in. So it's going to be stormy. Red skies in morning, sailors take warning. And this is what Jesus is saying. He says, when evening comes, you know. So basically, the first point is that human beings are made to be reasonable. We can reason. We can think. And then he says, at the end of verse 3, you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you can't even interpret the signs of the time. Jesus came, and what we're going to see is he came doing amazing things. Things that only the Messiah could do. But they didn't believe. What he's saying is, not only are we made to be reasonable, but faith also, faith in God, is reasonable. So why didn't they believe? Verse 4. A wicked and adulterous generation. Sin causes you to be unreasonable. The reason people don't believe is because they don't want to believe. I'll prove it to you. Go to Matthew 21. In verses 23 to 27. The reason I'm, I'm showing you this is because when we go to John, Jesus is going to bring out reasonable proofs for you to believe in God. But most of you who don't believe, it's not because there's not enough proof, it's because you don't want to. Starting in verse 23. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, again, the chief priests, Pharisees, Sadducees, 
They asked Jesus, who gives you the right to do these things? By what authority? Jesus replied, all right, before I answer you, I'll ask you one question. By what authority did John baptize? If you can answer that, then I'll answer you. So he says in verse 25, John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it heaven or from men? Now watch how the Pharisees think in their mind. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the people. So, because they didn't like either option, so they answered, we don't know. What they're saying is that we don't like the options. And since we don't like the options, we're going to play stupid. That's what they're saying. That's what happens in faith. God has given us so many reasons to believe, but if I believe, then that means I've got to change my life. Hmm. So either I believe and change my life, or I don't believe, so I can keep living the way I want. So you could say, okay, so you're telling me faith is reasonable. Prove it. Not only will I prove it, but Jesus will. That's what we're going to talk about today. Go to John chapter 5. Jesus is going to, one uh, commentator said, wouldn't it be great to have Jesus come up and prove that he's God? Well, that's what John 5 is really happening here. He just got in a discussion saying that I'm equal to the Father. The Father's at work, and so am I. Because I and the Father basically are one. And now he's going to give some proof of this. Starting in verse 31, he says in John 5, If I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is valid. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John, for the very work of the Father has given me to finish, and which I am doing testifies that the Father who has sent me himself. All right, what we're going to do is we are going to look at, Jesus gives us a scale. He's going to give a scale of proof. Proof that he is who he says he is. He's going to prove that he's God. But he's going to uh, marshal out some evidence. Some of the evidence he's going to say, really, it's weak. But some of the evidence is strong. Or some of my support, some of my argument is strong. The first thing he says in verse 31 is this. It might sound odd, but you'll see what I mean. Verse 31, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. He's using a Jewish law. If you're going to ever establish a case, you need to have two witnesses. And what he's saying is personal, personal testimony is it's not, it's not heavy. It's light. It's like a feather. It doesn't count. If you want to go to the court of law and you stand up and testify for yourself, it really means nothing. Doesn't mean anything. I can remember this one time when that really was vivid to me. I had a roommate in college, he was from the South, and he talked like this. And if you ever had a friend that was from the South, they can tell a tale, let me tell you. And we went out that night, we went out to our friend's house, and here's what we did. We went to our friend's house, we sat on the couch, we watched ESPN, we played Euchre, we sat on the couch, played ESPN, checked our watch, said it's getting late, and we went home. That's what we did. We walk into the hallway of our dorm. Our neighbor, who lived next to us in the dorm, said, how was your night? Was it a good, did you have a good time? Where were you guys? Here's what my roommate said. Oh, man, we had the best time you ever saw. It was crazy. We had a wild time. And he meant it. And I'm thinking... It's, nah, no, no, no. We watched ESPN. It was kind of stupid, actually. But I was realizing his personal testimony is as light as a feather. 
And we buy in the testimonies of people's personal opinion all the time. We are so gullible. And so what Jesus is saying is, when it comes to a matter of proof and court of law, my testimony is not valid. What's interesting in John 8, 14, he says, my testimony is valid. He's saying intrinsically, I am God, so my testimony is valid. But when it comes to the issue of proof, it's, it doesn't, it's not valid. So verse 32, he's saying there's another who testifies about me. That's what happens in verse 36. So let's go to verse 33. You have sent to John, and he testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. What is he saying here? He's saying that John is like this. John is like a flower that's pierced for a little bit. And you can listen to it, but his testimony can only point to me. So he says, human testimony, it's not valid. Personal testimony and human testimony is not valid. Human testimony is weak. It just blows away. It's light. Not only that, human testimony can't prove anything. For instance, if I go to Doug Kruger, I say, Doug, have you ever tasted honey? And if Doug never got out in the world, he goes, no, I've never had honey. Doug, it's sweet. It tastes great. Does he really know what it tastes like? I can point him to the honey, but I can't prove to him the honey tastes sweet. Human testimony can't prove. Actually, somebody asked me, said, but aren't we supposed to testify? Yes, we testify, but our testimony isn't necessarily always true. Even if we experience something, sometimes it's really not true. So human testimony can only point to something. It can't prove anything. So what's the proof? Jesus here in verse 36 says, I have a testimony that is weighty, like this. It's heavy like this weight. Compared to the feather, it's weighty. What is it? Because I'm telling you, we don't think it's weighty. We think these things down here matter so much. Did you see all the comments on my Facebook post? <laughs> Stupid. But this stuff, this stuff is what you have to form your faith on. Two things, what are they? Well, God is going to give evidence. Verse 36, he says, I have a testimony weightier than John. For the very work the Father has given me to finish, in which I am doing, testifies that the Father has sent me. Jesus just healed a man. He told a man to take up your mat and walk. Jesus healed the blind. Jesus rose the dead. That was the Father working through him to prove that Jesus was the one who was sent. Go to the book of Matthew again, chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 1, it's interesting because this is talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist, he was a preacher in the desert. We learned that a while ago. He was actually imprisoned by Herod because Herod was having an adulterous affair and a lady who was having an affair with didn't like John, so they put him in jail. And John, he had a little bit of dark days in the prison and he was wondering, is Jesus really the Messiah? So look in verse 2. While John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect another one? Are you the one? I spent my whole life pointing to you. I hope you're the one. So Jesus told his disciples, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. And he's quoting Isaiah that was prophesied 700 years before he came, but showing how he fulfilled Isaiah. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear and the dead are raised. And the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is a man who does not fall away on account of me. In other words, my work should prove to you I am 
the one. You know, it's really interesting in a book of John at the very end, it said he did so many things, so many miracles, that if we wrote down everything he did, libraries couldn't hold it. That's how much work Jesus did. The second thing, if we go back to John, in verse 37 of chapter 5, it says, And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You've never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he has sent. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. In other words, the second evidence is his word. Scripture was given to prove Jesus' existence as the Son of God, as Messiah. Here's the problem. They studied the Scriptures not to find Christ. They studied the Scriptures because they thought the Scriptures themselves was what mattered. You can look at it like this. How do you study the Bible? Go ahead to the next, next slide. How do you study the Bible? There's two ways to study the Bible, and there's two ways people study the Bible. One way brings new life to you. One way actually makes you very irritating. You you can become a very irritating Christian. Some people study the Bible like they would do an autopsy. They take their scalpel and they try to find when the Antichrist is going to appear at what time. They try to see if the different dispensations happened according to this word in Matthew. Even though the kingdom of heaven is in Matthew, it might mean something different in Luke. And they have all of these, they, they cut and divide and paste and they become these scholars. Do you believe in superlapsarianism or superlapsarianism? Did, did Jesus, did God choose Adam before Adam sinned or did he choose Adam after Adam? It, it can be craziness. I'm telling you, if you've ever been to seminary, because somebody knows Hebrew, they think they are the next thing to God. But that's not how you go to Scripture. You should study Scripture like Lucy went in the wardrobe in Narnia. The Bible should open up to you like the wardrobe. I come to this book looking for God. And he invites me into a world with him. He gives promises to me. He says, ask and you will find. Seek, and you will find. Ask, and you will receive. Knock, and the door will be open. Do I just say, oh, ask, huh? If I go to the Greek word of that, it's used differently in the different Greek written manuscripts. And, no, ask. You understand that. God, I need you. Help. I jump into this book, and when I do, new life is given to me. A lot of people just use this book like a textbook and not like an invitation to a relationship. Now I want to show you, go back to John 5, my favorite part in this passage. What Jesus is going to do is they ask for proof. He said, I give you two. I'm giving you two. Just study my works and study my words, and it's up to you to believe or not. But I've got question for you. In other words, he's going to turn the tables in verse 41. He says, I do not accept praise from men. I could really care less if you believe in me or not right now. Not Now he cares if you believe, but how you talk about me. Because I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. He's talking to the Pharisees. I have come in my Father's name and you do not accept me. But If someone else comes in his own name, someone else comes in their feather testimony, you'll accept him. I want to show you just a quick history of how true this is. It's tragic how gullible we are if somebody comes in their own name because we think they're impressive or they're confident. We believe them. Somebody comes in his own name, you'll accept him. Watch. It started even 400 years before Jesus. This guy came. He said he's the the incarnation of a God that doesn't exist. He's called the Buddha. 
That's 400 years before. Next came these guys called Caesars. One was Julius and all of his sons. They said they're gods. That's why they killed thousands of Christians who said, no, there's a real God. But because these guys said they're gods, everybody believed them. After Caesar came, this guy drives me crazy. Because you're not allowed to talk about the truth of this guy. But this guy said, I am the final prophet. I am the messenger. And if you don't listen to me, I'll chop off your head. Truthfully. Actually, he had 50, directly 50 people killed. And he was supposed to be a holy prophet. But he had 10 people killed. He had 10 people killed because they recited negative poetry about him. A little insensitive to me. Even if I said that, they get sensitive about me even saying that. It's crazy. Go to the next one. This guy is named Charlemagne. He brought both the church and the state together because he was the great father of this new kingdom. Man crowned him, but he said, God crowned me as well. He got mad at one group who wouldn't take on Christianity and he beheaded them because he's got the right. Go to the next slide. This guy was crazy too, Genghis Khan. He killed one, one battle, he killed over a million people. One whole town slaughtered all women and children because he was the self-claimed Lord of all. I'm Lord over everything. He actually ruled 22% of the earth's land mass at one time. He was a disgusting man. People bought into his lies. Go to the next one. This guy, Ivan the Terrible, one of the czars of Russia, he called himself the representative of heaven. Yes, you are. He wanted to unify Russia, and to do that, he had to kill 60 to 100,000 of his own people. That's kind of why they call him terrible. Go to the next. Napoleon Bonaparte, actually, before they crowned him, he grabbed the crown and crowned himself. He was mad at some slavery, I mean, some Caribbean slaves that didn't behave, so he just said, kill them. Killed over 100,000 of them. Go to the next slide. Frederick Nietzsche, he's an existential nihilistic philosopher who's an atheist, didn't believe in God. He coined the phrase, the death of God, in one of his, one of his books, but it was bought into, and he also coined this phrase called Uberman or Superman. There's going to be a man who rules by might because he says so. What's funny is poor guy died of syphilis, and he went insane, but he thought he was the most sane man that ever lived. Go to the next slide. Here's three men that bought into his philosophy. One is Lenin. Lenin was, he, people called him the great genius of mankind. They all bought into him. He wanted to unify the whole world in communism, but to start, he had to kill a million of his own people to get the thing rolling. Just a little, just a, that's just a little number. Next guy, I think, is, he, this guy's horrid. Joseph Stalin. People called him father of nations. You know what some of his people called him? Gardener of human happiness. That's a title they gave him, and he slaughtered 35, of his own, 35 million of his own people. There's one story where Stalin was in front of his political people there in the Kremlin, and when he'd, when he'd come into the room, they'd all stand and they'd all clap. Everybody clap. No, 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 oh, you don't have to. No, 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 I'm just showing you what they had to do. They had to keep going like this because the first person who would stop clapping, and this is true, they would pull him out and kill him. He was a great man. Go to the next slide. I don't even talk about that man. Go to the next slide. This is the man who has the red sun in our hearts. To institute his communism, he had 30 million peasants starved to death because he wanted to implement. Communism is a great ideology. Go to the next slide. This guy, he's not, as, he's not as terrible as those guys, but he is kind of terrible. He had the helter-skelter murders because he told the people in his commune family that he was Jesus Christ. Go to the next slide. John Lennon said, our popular, I, he's, I just kind of put that on there because I think it's funny. He said, we're more popular than Jesus Christ. Go to the next slide. Pol Pot, if you ever saw the killing fields, he was wicked. But he exalted himself as, I am the great dictator of Cambodia. Go to the next slide. Idi Amin, terrible man. Just terrible man. He just said, you listen to me. If you don't, he'd kill you. Next slide. 
Jim Jones believed he was the reincarnation of Gandhi, Buddha, Jesus Christ, and Father Divine. He led 900 people to drink Kool-Aid laced with cyanide. They believed him. Next slide. Ayatollah Khomeini, he called himself the source of all emulation, or I am the divine guide of the people. But if you don't listen to me, I'll kill you. He had 30,000 killed who disagreed with him. Next slide. Sung Young Moon, he's a funny one. He said, I, am, I, I and my wife are the, are the true parents. I have deity in me. And if, you, if I have you married, your children will be born without sin. He did one ceremony of 25,000 married couples. See how people buy into people's self-promotion? It's baloney. Go to the next slide. David Koresh, he's the one with the, all that crazy stuff with Janet Reno, but he said he was the chosen one. Go to the next slide. Saddam Hussein, you know about him, but his people were starving, and he had 75 of his own palaces. Right, Brian? Go to the next slide. This is uh, Dennis Rodman's best buddy right now. But this guy, to be leader, killed a lot of his family members. And there's a lot of, his own people are in slave camps. And then go to the last slide. This guy drives me the most crazy because he acts so holy. He literally lets people call him his holiness. He is supposed to be the reincarnation or the incarnation of a God who doesn't exist because they don't believe that God exists, but somehow he exists. And he teaches this, that even though God doesn't exist, everything's God. That's unreasonable. Do you know that? And people bow to that guy like he's holy. What in the world's wrong with us? That's why Jesus said, I don't accept human testimony. But there is somebody that testified about me. These scriptures and my father did. So he's go back to John. He's talking to the Pharisees who really are puffed up with themselves. And he's going to now turn the tables on them and say, you guys probably think you're pretty impressive. The problem with you is you didn't come to me. Look at verse 45. But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Well, let's start in 44 because he's talking about how they accept praise from one another. How can you believe if you accept praise from one another? Yet make no effort to obtain the praise that comes from the only God. But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you would have believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you don't believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? So what he's going to say is they, they think they're impressive, they they're impressed by each other saying good things about them. What he's saying is you have Moses. Do you remember Moses? Moses, Moses came down out of the mountain to kind of ask you to prove it. See, they said, Moses, go up there and talk to God for us, and we'll do whatever he says. Three times they literally said this. Go ahead and click it. They said, we can do it. We can do it. You can read it in Exodus. You, just, you talk to God. We don't want to talk to him, but you just tell him what to do. We can do it. Moses said, okay, but there's one stipulation. If you don't do it, you die. It's a bad deal, but you die. If they were honest, and this is what he's saying here, if they were honest, they would realize they can't do it. Do you know the law was not given to show us we're good people? The law was given to reveal how wicked we are. Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Ever. Because you're not supposed to according to the scriptures. Have you ever lusted after anybody? Have you ever wanted something somebody owns? That's called covetous. Jesus said if you do it in your heart, you're guilty. That's the purpose of the law. Go to, I want to finish with Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3, verse 22. See, the law is not given to us so we can obey it and become perfect. The law is given to us because it's a reflection of the perfect character of God and how we match up. We're desperately broken. Verse 22, the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin 
so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before faith came, we were held prisoners by the law. That's the, the commandments of God. They held us prisoners. Why? Verse 24, it was put in charge to lead us to Christ. The law's objective was to reveal to us that we needed a Savior. That's what Jesus means by, if you would have believed Moses, you would believe in me. Sometimes we think we can actually be good to fulfill those. We can't. We need somebody who's good on our behalf. And when I have faith in Christ, his righteousness is given to me. When I believe in Christ, I stand on his work, on everything he did is, a, is accredited to me. That's the beauty of justification. When I believe in Jesus, not only are my sins forgiven, but all of his works are given to me. They're mine. Now when the Father sees me, he's delighted in me by faith. When we try to work it on our own, if we're honest, we can't do it. In fact, there's only one person to impress. I think people do the law to try to impress each other, but there's only one person to impress. Go to the last thing. It's Christ. We impress one audience, the audience of one, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're the ones that matter. It's funny, in the Old Testament, God had two men, David and Jeremiah. God told David, you're going to be the king of Israel. Every time David obeyed, Israel was blessed. Jeremiah's job was to actually condemn Israel. When he did his job, he was thrown into a pit. But if we are to evaluate their lives, we would say David was successful and Jeremiah was a failure. But when David was faithful, he was exalted. When Jeremiah was faithful, he was thrown into a pit. So often you and I evaluate our lives by how well our life is going or how bad we're doing. We try to impress each other with how look how rich or how important or this. That's not the question. What has God asked you to faithfully do? He has asked me to faithfully preach. Some people come into my office and say, oh, you love preaching, don't you? Actually, I'm one of those guys that if I would sit in the back of the audience, I'd be okay with that. I'd be fine with that. I don't need to be up here. Some people would love this job so they could be up here to preach. But I know God has asked me to do it, and I'm responsible to be as faithful as possible. Some of you have been asked to work a job where you dig ditches and to do it well. Some of you have asked to be a mom to take care of kids that scream. And you're like, oh man, I'm a failure. According to who? You have to be faithful to the audience of one. And what has he asked you to be faithful to? Be faithful to it. Don't try to impress other people. Jesus said people's opinions don't really mean anything. Did you see all those leaders they're willing to follow? There's only one person whose opinion matters. The audience of one. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for everything you do for us, Lord. and Thank you for the holiness of your Son who died on our behalf so we can be holy in him. Help us, Lord, not to be so gullible not to be so impressed. Help us, Father, to weigh matters, and, but help us to also be really proud of Jesus because he he's been testified by his work in the word of God. We can stand on those things. Those are proof. Thank you for this day, and I just pray that the rest of this weekend we can really just not just enjoy the beauty that you've created, but that we can glorify you. Jesus name we pray. Amen.